excited to come talk to you today about the humanity difference at Braze. Um, and I'm excited to announce that, uh, you know, my name is Will Crocker and I'm our customer experience lead here at Braze. I direct our customer success team. And I'm here with a really special guest today. Uh, we have Dipanjan Chatterjee, who some of you may know. He's our uh, vice president and principal analyst coming to us from Forrester Research. Really special guest today, excited to have you. Welcome to Panjan. Thank you, Will. Can you uh, hear me okay? We can hear you great. You're coming through Perfect. loud and- Perfect. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, well, hello everyone uh, and welcome. And uh, thank you so much for joining us um, you know, and trusting us with your time. So let me um, trust you with uh, you know, one of my deep dark secrets. And then before I do that, Will, I think um, I need the slide to advance to my, ah, here we go, perfect. Um, so here is my fear that keeps me up at night. Okay. And the scenario is something like this. Um, I am in my Uber, rushing to the airport, late for my flight, uh, dash out from the car, get into the terminal, and I realize that I don't have my phone. And this is just a nightmare. I don't have a boarding pass. I don't have my Starbucks uh, card to swipe and get my drink. I'm not going to be able to get my, uh, my hotel uh, door unlocked with my phone. Uh, and forget about all the emails and the messages that I won't receive, right? If this is a nightmare scenario for me, can you imagine what a few days without a phone must be like for a 20-year-old without Instagram? Right. Um, what's really changed the way the way we communicate, the way we interact today, um, is a force that we at Forrester like to call hyper adoption. And essentially, what's happened with hyper adoption has been that there's been a proliferation of devices and of channels. Now, just to give you an idea. In 2014, we had more mobile devices on this planet than we had human beings. Voice assistant instances will also outpace human beings. And it will do it in about half the time that it took mobile devices to do the same thing. In about four short years, 2022, 50% of US households will have smart speakers. Now, it's not just about devices, but it's also the, the media, the methods that we use to communicate. So most social networks what they sold have about a billion users. And it's not just about how many, but how quickly. So just to give you an idea, when Facebook first got started, it took them six years, six years to get to its first 500 million users. It took them six months to get its next 500 million. So that gives you a sense of the rapid pace of hyper adoption. Wow, that's incredible. So, you know, Will, when we uh, set about doing this research, um, one of the things that we wanted to validate with our data um, was this always on nature of mobile and technology. So in the research that we did together, um, we pretty much validated our sense of people being inextricably connected to their devices and to their channels. So if you look at the data that's on the slide, and if you look in the left-hand side, Essentially, it says everyone, you know, 96% of people um, are using their phones on a daily basis, and a full three quarters of them are intensive users of their mobile devices. If you look over to the right, you get a sense of what it is that they do with mobile. Um, so they are discovering using their search engines. They are uh, being creative uh, with photos and videos. They're communicating using chat. They're entertaining themselves with games and streaming and so on and so forth. So it, it, this is almost an, a microcosm of their entire lives encapsulated in their mobile behavior. So as we, um, Forrester and Braze, 
set out to understand what humanity was all about. Um, we wanted to understand if consumers perceived their brand to act with humanity at every interaction. Now, even before we jumped into the nature of humanity, uh, it, it was important for us to understand the nature of interaction. So what you see on the slide in front of you is roughly how consumers interact with brands on a daily basis. Right? Um, and what is very clear from the data is the interaction is primarily digital. Primarily, not always. Um, there is a component of the physical, and you'll see that right at the bottom around visiting a physical location, some component of services support. But the idea here is that if you have to think about interacting with humanity, you have to realize that a vast majority of interaction happens using a digital format. So all of this brought us to a very interesting place. We are raising questions about the humanity of communications, but it's evidently clear that most communication is digital in nature. So we are left with this, if you will, antithetical proposition. Can we be more human with more machines? And as we address that question, we also have to address the fundamental question. In, in this digital world of machines, does humanity even matter? Is it worth it for brands to be human? Now, I will tell you this, that this question has been studied quite intensively in the academic world. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, a psychologist, has won a Nobel Prize in economics for showing the impact of emotions in decision making. The Nobel laureate in economics from last year, Richard Taylor, one of my old professors at the University of Chicago, um, received his prize for essentially showing that human decision making is predictably irrational. Now, what we've never done, though, is investigated this question outside of academia. We've never really tested these propositions for brands and for how they pertain to human communication. So that's exactly what we set out to do. We launched a research study. We went out and spoke with and when I say spoke, I mean we surveyed a little over 3,000 consumers. We looked at a broad geography, evenly spaced between North America, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, Asia Pacific. Uh, these folks, which is really representative of kind of the urban uh, demographic in, in developing countries and pretty much the entire demographic in developed countries all own smartphones. Um, you see some more data around their shopping behavior, 60% purchased online in the past month. You see a little bit of the demographic distribution, which uh, our researchers assure us is the right one to study to represent the entire population. So that's a little bit about kind of the, the bones um, of the research work that we did. Now, more interestingly, to kind of move to the findings from the research. So our purpose here was to ask our respondents to tell us if a recent brand communication or interaction was human. And then we went out and asked them a whole array of questions that we used in our analysis to get to our findings. So when we posed this question to them about human communication, uh, this is what we told them, right? So this is how we described human communication. So I wanted to share with you, um, almost as if you were in the shoes of our respondents, how you would be thinking of communication and brands as it pertains to humanity. So human communication, it occurs when a brand communicates in a way that's natural. Uh, it, it reflects how human beings interact through speech, it's how we talk. It demonstrates an understanding of the needs, the wants, the situation, the context, and is appropriately informal. Again, it's not sort of a stilted business in a formal conversation, but it's how two people get together and exchange ideas. So that's our thinking of human communication. Here's the first um, 
really sort of breathtaking finding that came out from the study. So there's a lot going on in that slide. So let me break it up for you a little bit. What we are trying to understand is if a person perceived a communication to be human, did he or she then tend to behave or react differently towards the brand, right? So the darker green bar that you see are people who've said, no, I did not perceive any human communication from the brand. The lighter bar that you see are people said, yes, the way the brand interacted with me was human. Does it make a difference? Clearly, yes. So if you take the first bar, people who perceived the brand to be more human were twice as likely to love the brand. And then you read along the chart and you look at outcomes that matter to a brand. If you were a brand owner, a business owner, a brand manager, you want people to love your brand. You you want people to go through the traditional consumer funnel and purchase your brand. You want people to be satisfied with your brand on a daily basis. You want people to go out and recommend your brand and shout out the name of your brand from the rooftops, right? These are the things as a manager, as an owner of a brand you're trying to drive. What this chart says is that if your brand communicates with humanity, you are going to be somewhere in the range of one and a half to two times as likely to positively, positively influence all of those outcomes. And if you look at the chart on the right hand side, you are much more likely to engender loyalty within your consumer base. So that was a very dramatic finding because it said, look, you know, to be human is not just sort of this loosey goosey fuzzy idea of I'm a better brand. To be human is to be more potent in driving financial value for your brand. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an incredible finding. I mean, it's something I feel like we've been talking about at Braze for years. And I think Forrester's been mentioning about how these customer expectations are increasing and people want a more personal connection. I think you kind of cracked the code and quantified that here in a really powerful way. It's amazing. Yeah, well, I think, you know, intuitively, people have sensed this all along, right? They, they know that the right way to interact uh, is the way that is natural to us, the way that we're used to. I think the big deficit used to be that up until now, there was no way to demonstrate um, on paper, quantitatively, that there is a real financial impact to this. Um, you know, in my work, I often speak with C-suite executives who don't necessarily work on a daily basis with, with marketing and sort of psychology and so on. People who are much more mired in their financial reporting and PL and, and financial models, for them, they always sought some kind of hard validation that, you know, modifying your brand in this more human dimension would actually pay off for them financially. It would increase their valuation, increase stock price. So I think what we've started here is a journey to demonstrate that there is a hard link between humanity and financial value. Absolutely. So all that being said, um, if you agree that humanity is a fantastic thing to foster in your brand, the obvious next question is, boy, what on earth is this thing called humanity. You know, what does it mean to be human? Because that's an extremely ambiguous word and it could mean many things for many people. So the next challenge that we took on is to say, hey, let's look at all of the data. Let's chop it up into little pieces and then stitch them back up together to see if we can understand if there are certain themes, certain pathways that drive humanity. And what we found was that there were sort of three central elements underneath this notion of humanity. The first one is the idea of emotion. And what this says at a high level, and I'll give you a little bit more detail of few slides on, but at a high level, do you engage emotionally, activating deeper needs and wants? 
rather than communicate just features and functionality, right? So that's what emotional communication is about. That accounts for about a third of the humanity. The next third, or actually 36%, is about being natural. Now, again, this should make intuitive sense. Does a brand communicate with you in the way you would communicate with people around you, your friends, your family, your business associates, of course, tempered by relevance and appro appropriateness. You know, you might talk differently to your grandkids than you would to your boss, but there is still the same underlying theme of humanity. Is that transported over by the brand in the way that they are communicating with you? Is the natural human element present? in that communication. And the next third of it, which I like to break into sort of two pieces, is, is this communication from the brand something that is personal to you and relevant to you? And is it considerate in that it shows an awareness of your needs? And in turn, it actually caters to your needs. So it demonstrates that it cares, it understands, and it's willing to do something about it, right? So at a very high level, those are the three components of humanity. So let me kind of uh, you know dig down a little bit uh, and double click, right? So what did we mean when we said, look, it's critically important to be emotional? So in the survey, um, we had... Uh, uh, several hu sort of human emotional attributes that we tested to discern which of them would be important in driving humanity. And what you see, the, the list on top, the first box there, are the emotional drivers that had the strongest correlation to perceptions of humanity. So I, I will let you read that list. Um, but to me, it speaks of a brand that is open, that's accessible, that is an ally, that is trusted. These are the emotions that respondents are telling us are valuable for them and constitute a demonstration of humanity. Now, it's also important to understand what is not. Right. So you have a second box of other sort of emotional attributes, uh, you know, being amusing and quirky and exciting and fun and surprising. You know, what we essentially found um, was that you cannot really afford to get away by being kind of sensationalist and, and really kind of pulling a cheap stunt to get someone's attention. Right. That's not what emotional activation is about. Emotional activation is much more about forming a more sustaining bond that you really can't get to with some cheap trick. So that's sort of the the emotional aspect of it. Let's dig down a little bit into the um, the, the, the natural and the functional components as well. So what does it mean to be natural? You speak like a regular person, you communicate using that same tone, and you speak clearly and you send understandable messages, right? That's what natural is. Consider it, value their time in business, be responsive, communicate with them at times that are convenient, and use the preferred contact method. It shows consideration for the needs and the preferences of your consumer. What does it mean to be personal? Show that you understand what matters to them. Provide great recommendations that really adds value to the relationship. Um, and not only positively provide value, but also understand what they don't like, understand their preferences, and shield them and avoid doing what they don't like. So it's both the positive and the negative. So that's the personal aspect of it. So this is, so. It, so if you imagine this world of humanity being composed of these building blocks of emotion, of naturalness, of personalized and considerate, you can double click down on all of these and understand what the components are. Now, 
We won't get into all of that today, uh, but we do have a wonderful study that's out there that should be accessible to you. So if you're interested in sort of a more granular take at what these things are, I would highly recommend uh, you go there. And what we've also done in that study is use these component drivers to create what is a brand humanity index. And essentially what you see on that slide is a schema of how we put it together. Now this is a quantitative index, which essentially means that all of the analytical horsepower that went into doing this model is reflected in a formula that can help brands calculate their humanity index. Again, at a very high level, this is how I think of it. There are two pieces that go into your brand humanity, the what and the how. The what is what emotions will you activate? The how is how will you do it? And how will you demonstrate those emotions, th that connection in a tone that's natural, in a manner that's personalized, uh, and in a way that a considerate of the consumer that you're working with. So again, this is the schema for an analytical model. There's much more about it in the thought leadership paper that we've put together. Um, but again, this I, I will emphasize, um, you know, we are, this is sort of a delicate balancing act, right? We talk a lot about humanity and, and emotions and things that most people perceive um, to be sort of the old world, loosey goosey, nebulous notion of marketing and brand. This is quite the opposite. You know, what we've tried to do is we've tried to frame them in a way that's quantitative, that frame them in a way that can be modeled. And we do this because if you can't really frame them in this way, there's really nothing you can do about it, right? Because I don't want you to leave the session in a going away just feeling good, but unable to actually put all of this into use. So the quantitative and the modeling nature of this work really empowers you and enables you to do something with it. So I'm going to leave you with three final things. Where do you get started, right? Um, what's the right frame of mind to think about building humanity? And if you've already had humanity in your brand, extending that humanity out, right? How do you reap the rewards of humanity in your brand? And I'm going to just leave you with three things, and I call them mindset, machines, and measurement. The first is the right mindset is one of empathy. That is really what underlies what we're talking about. You know, there's the great uh, American novel, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, and Atticus Finch, and that says, to really understand someone, you have to crawl into their skin. If you are talking about understanding the humanity of someone, understanding how you can be personalized, understanding what it takes to be considerate of their needs, you have to have empathy. Every driver of humanity speaks to an empathetic approach. And then what you would need to do is be able to trigger that empathy within your organization. Right? So you can't think of communication as set apart and standalone from the rest of your business. Right, Every single consumer touch point has to demonstrate what communication demonstrates. Right, That the humanity has to be infused into every touch point. Hence, that notion of empathy has to be instilled into everyone who is executing at those touch points. So that's my first one. Uh, a mindset of empathy. The second one is, is machines, because while we've spent a lot of time talking about humanity, I don't want you to forget the power of machines. Humans are fallible, right? We, uh, we don't process things very quickly. We can't remember very much. We can only hold about seven things in our brains. Uh, machines are different. They have practically limitless storage. They have hyper fast processing and now thanks to the advances of technology uh, there is deep learning so there's inbuilt intelligence that grows organically you take all of that and you realize that with machines unlike with humans you now have a solution that's scalable and because it's scalable it's also cost feasible 
So if you take the power of humans and humanity and you execute it through the power of machines, it, it really creates a winning combination. I will leave you with this final idea of measurement, right? Again, as I've said several times before, humanity sounds fuzzy. It's tough to implement fuzzy. You need to measure your brand essence. You need to measure your communication. And you need to measure your brand humanity. And hopefully, if you have a chance to look at the thought leadership paper, the brand humanity index will give you some good ideas about how you can start out uh, really putting a much more robust framework around understanding brand humanity. Well, that's everything that I have for all of you today. Um, uh, later on uh, in the call, happy to take questions. Absolutely, yeah. We'll have time for questions at the end. So as we continue going, uh, and thank you to Ponch, and that was really fantastic. Uh, please continue putting questions into the uh, the console so we can answer them at the end. We'd love to, to take some of them. But you know, I really think that idea of mindsets, machines, and measurement is a really fantastic lead into what we'd like to talk to you about. Braze here, the brand humanity index that we've been working on in partnership with you because. This conversation, as we start to put some of these, you know, previously, I think, as you put it very well, Dupont, and these were fuzzy ideas. These were sort of nebulous ideas around what does it mean to be human? Putting this into a quantifiable framework where you can actually start to evaluate every time you're sending out a message or having any sort of contact with your customer, whether or not it be an email, a push notification, and a message, or even like a support interaction evaluating about whether or not that was a human interaction and thinking about that qualitatively, really I think it's gonna help brands drive the ball forward in terms of thinking about how to take actions to improve every single one of those transactions. So, you know, our hypothesis here, Bray, isn't something we wanna talk about. It's just about, it's really aligned, I think, with what you've been saying this entire time, is that in a world where brands are communicating with us across personal channels, across, you know, intimately, you know, personal things like the phone that you have in your pocket that literally goes around with you every single place you go, everywhere you go, every single day. That's an intensely personal relationship. And if you're not taking advantage of that, and if you're not being respectful of that, and being a human being in that interaction and recognizing that you've been let into a special world for that person, um, then you're not going to be successful. So really that hypothesis is that brands to communicate with customers in a way that feels human, that feels personal, that feels organic, are going to have measurably stronger customer engagement and affinity for their brand. So the Braze Brand Humanity Index is a tool that we're working on in partnership with, par, partnership with Forrester to identify what attributes make brands feel human to consumers. What concrete things and kind of values can you measure yourself against and analyze uh, uh, and how you're transacting those things to really understand the business impact of every single one of those attributes. So BHI, just putting it to the test a little bit, we kind of tried to distill this down with Forrester around the emotional and functional attributes that are most likely to drive perceptions to brand humanity. And it actually came out to something really simple. If you think about the emotional attributes and sort of like the functional descriptors here, Emotional, it was all around the sort of types of things that you might think of as a friend or as a confidant or even just a, a colleague, if you will. Someone who's responsive, someone who's social, someone who's friendly, thoughtful, helpful, personable, intelligent, honest, reassuring. All these things are something where every single time you're talking to a customer, whether it be a via support interaction, a push notification, an SMS, an email, they're looking for something that actually gives them the right information with the right tone, the right level of humility, the right level of personability to actually make it feel like an organic interaction. And on the functional side of things, the things that we saw were actually the most actionable, just to recap, were things were people who speak like a regular person would, not using you know, highfalutin language or overly technical language, showing that they value your time in business you know, communicating me within a tone I want them to. They're responsive to me when I need it. They're sending me clear, understandable messages, not things I have to decipher and pick through. They're showing they understand what matters to me right now and having that kind of contextual relevance with every single message. They're communicating me with the convenient times. They're communicating with me on a preferred contact method and providing great recommendations, understanding my preferences and avoiding what I don't like. 
all these things sound really simple in some ways in terms of what you would expect out of a friend or confidant. But I think the tricky thing is, is actually executing on all these ideals. And that's stuff where like, well, that's something that Braze helps a lot with. That's really where we come into the situation is helping brands actually build systems and build engines and build a customer communication program, a customer journey, if you will, that really exhibits all of these kind of modalities of respect to that customer experience at every single time. That's something I'm impassioned about here about the as a customer experience uh, director here at Braze. And I think it's something that if you're joining this webinar, it's something that you're likely thinking that you need to do more around as well. So really what I'd like to kind of get into is some ways that we actually can help drive that conversation. How can we help people, you know, do things like, for example, communicate at convenient times? How can we make sure that you're providing a great recommendation and not just something that you want to sell, but something that the customer wants to buy? Those kind of things in the moment when you're thinking about the real time interactions that you're having with every single customer and the fact that in any given moment, I'm sure if you checked a push notification or an email during this presentation, you probably looked at it for, you know, a tenth of a second. That's the window of attention span you're going to get from every single one of your customers. And it takes a combination of all of these attributes and all of these kind of descriptors to actually warrant a second look, to get people to take a little bit to look deeper. Um, and that's really where we want to go today. So one of the ways we do that at Braze is some a feature that's extremely powerful and is, is just a way that of our most dynamic kind of human brands, the ones that are, I think would rate the highest on the brand humanity index, are using a feature called connected content to drive real-time contextual messaging. Let me take a step back and tell you a little bit about what connected content is. So I think, you know, previously and a lot of legacy tools out there, if you're wanting to bring personalized content to a user, you might be loading that into some, you're probably loading up a list of users into some, you know, legacy player out there. You're loading up a list of information that they might be able to kind of reference and emails and do like a mail merge or something like that. The problem is by the time you get all that set up, it's stale. The data is not valuable anymore. It's not as fresh anymore. If you're thinking about an e-commerce use case, for example, you might be uploading prices that have changed based upon your inventory or things have sold out. So we decided to take that to the next generation with brands and give brands an opportunity to reach out and ask themselves at the time of send, what should I say to this person? Some great examples here on the board. You can see Momondo, for example, saying, fly to New York for just $443. Don't miss out, book now. This is a great example of when a brand, for example, might look and say, hey, this person hasn't booked a trip in a while. And it's not clear exactly what I should send them. So you might look out and say, hey, Momondo, at the time of send for this user or for this type of user, for example, maybe it's never traveled to America or frequently traveled to America in the past, or you know, has looked at flights in this price range, for that kind of user, what should I reach out and show them right now? And that's where if people are doing things like connecting content recommendation engines to their real-time messaging via a tool like Braze, bringing in that content to make sure it's absolutely relevant, absolutely contextual, that is something that's really gonna interest and matters and is personalized to them. It's much more like a friend giving a recommendation and saying like, hey, have you seen this crazy flight deal? than it is just a brand promoting something that they want you to buy. That kind of relationship is important. And you can even see the tone, uh, the way they actually speak in a normal way, saying, here's a secret from a friend. That's the, a really excellent example of brand humanity. Um, other ways that you can see other co companies using out there are just incredible and numerous. Like you see brands, for example, like not picture on this slide, but we have brands that are even taking you know, for example, weather data at the time they're going to send a message, amount of food, imagine a food delivery service like Dupongen. Have you ever just decided it's too rainy and too terrible outside and that you want to order in food because you can't bear to either cook or go get something? I think we've all been there, right? Pretty much most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, definitely had a had downpour on Saturday and felt like that. I mean, that's this perfect time for a brand to reach out like a food delivery service and say, hey, it's really terrible weather in this person's area. We know that from connected content and they haven't used the app in two weeks. 
that's a perfect opportunity to re-engage me and remind me that maybe there is an easier way rather than schlepping through the rain to Whole Foods or Fairway or wherever I'm going and carrying back 30 pounds of groceries soaking wet and trying to unpack it. There's a better way and giving them that helpful reminder as a friend, as a confidant, as I think, where are we going? So lots of great examples here across the board from Amondo, Fan Exchange and others. Like it's really, really uh, a powerful feature to be able to reach out in real time and connect to a fresh data source, something that's completely live, not stale, and getting the real information from the source that you have it on your side in real time as you need to send it out, making sure that your prices are accurate, that your context is accurate, and bringing that into the message in real time. That's really what connected content's all about. So just to give you an idea about connected content and the open rate it drives, like just as DePonjo is saying, it's all about measuring this stuff. Connected content can be used to make your brand interactions more personal, more helpful, more considerate by providing these rate recommendations. But look at the kind of open rates that your increases we're actually able to drive. We're seeing 85% put Android push notification open rates for brands that use connected content in their push. We've seen 37% open rates in web messaging across in browser messages as well as web push notifications. 25% open rate, open rate increases in email. These are the kind of things that I think demonstrate how strongly, you know, exemplifying these attributes like being responsive, being personal, being helpful, being considerate, being thoughtful, and really understanding the context of your user and taking a second to ask someone or ask yourselves or ask your own systems, your own servers, what actually I should send to this person. It's something where the machine can help you, I think, to the point we've been making this entire time, make that human connection. I think another way that we actually drive personalized communications at, brand, at, at Braze with our brands is about something, we're using a tool called liquid personalization. And liquid is a dynamic templating language. It's something that, you know, an example of it up there is hello, first name, but you can drive way past that to get much, much higher engagement. People are using really personal data uh, for each one of their customers, understanding what product categories they've liked to interact with in the past, understanding if you're a news publisher, what articles have people been reading in the past, what kind of content have they either implicitly told you that they're interested in by their viewership and by their activity, or explicitly told you through using like in-app survey tools or in-browser survey tools to ask users what kind of content they actually wanna get. All of that rolls up to a more human experience. And when you get that, into a customer profile and bring that in from every different source, whether it be your app data, your web data, your loyalty databases, your backend data warehouses, and bring that into a centralized source like Braze, that's when you're able to leverage all this at, in real time across this diversity of channels, all of which are personal, SMS, mobile push, email. And you can see here some of the selected results we've shown you are incredible more than double the actual engagement rate on mobile push for brands that are actually using liquid and 28 percent increases on email you know it's it's interesting i feel like in many ways email with mail merges and things like that was probably a little bit more personalized five years ago than most of the other channels out there now but the consumer expectation is no longer single channels no longer that your emails are personalized because somebody knows what a mail merge is it's that every touch point across your customer experience is, is personalized and is humanized. And I think that we're seeing brands make that leap now and the results speak for themselves. So in terms of the when, the who, and the what, there are kind of three ways we think about campaigns at Braze and how you should be actually engaging your users. There's time-based campaigns, there's action-based campaigns, there's API-triggered campaigns, and all of these help you get back to the human elements. Time-based campaigns are great for kind of campaigns where you're starting to think about like, all right, where do I want to re-engage users who haven't done something? Say people who, you know, haven't used, uh, interacted with your brand, haven't opened the app, haven't engaged with your website, haven't opened an email in a period of time, and how do I want to speak to them? Using a recurring scheduled campaign to actually engage and reach out to those users is a perfect opportunity. But then there's also action-based campaigns, which are campaigns that are triggered in real time based upon a user taking an action. That might be, for example, a user abandoning a cart. That's a great opportunity for an action-based campaign. Or a user making a purchase for the first time and you wanna send them a confirmation and congratulation email. Or an, even an API-triggered campaign 
which are really action-based campaigns or better not user actions, but are things that on your side of the, on your side, you might know that you have new content that you need to push out to users because it's just that great. You can think of like, you know, a SoundCloud releasing uh, a new Beyonce album, I guess, or a new, you know, Taylor Swift album, for example, and wanting to race to get out there versus a Spotify and all their competitors. That's a great opportunity for API trigger notifications to deliver that content of race, but then still bringing all of that context from the consumer profile, bringing those attributes about the user to help determine who it's sent to, when it's sent, and what you're actually sending. How are you going to vary that talent for each one of those user groups? The, again, the results we've seen from these are really telling. You know, five years ago, six years ago, basically every tool out there was just upload lists, schedule campaigns. It was all the kind of time-based stuff that you can support now too. And that has its time and its place. You should definitely be using those sometimes as well. But the kind of more personalized, real-time contextual messaging that's available via action-based campaigns and API trigger campaigns are driving huge increases in open rates. We're seeing more than 330% increases based as time-based campaigns for action-based campaigns and 681% increases for API trigger campaigns. And this is actually particularly pronounced for email. When you think about a time-based email versus an action-based email, we're seeing 250% increases for email. Just it's, which is a massive result compared to some of the other email you know, enhancements you saw earlier. It's really an opportunity to take the next step and start evolving your brand to be more in the moment, to be something that's giving people the information when they want it, when they need it, and when they're interested in transacting on it, rather than just on a schedule every week and just sending them a weekly newsletter. People don't act that way. They have to get too many newsletters on Fridays now. Getting to them at the right time is really what matters. Um, lastly, I want to talk to you about the conversion rates we're seeing because the open rates are only part of the story. I mean, I think in 2018, if you're just measuring open rates as your only measure of engagement, um, there's more work to be done connecting that to what the actual events you want users to actually consume are. If, you know, opening is only part of the story. If you're an e-commerce brand that might be buying a product or it might be browsing a product. If you're a news publisher, it might be reading an article or even reading other articles unrelated to the one that you actually directly sent them. Measuring all these conversions and understanding the kind of increases you're going to get are critical. And the story even gets better beyond the open. 888% increases for action-based campaigns and even a little bit more for API trigger campaigns. We're seeing eight and nine X results for brands that are actually taking that next step, which is really powerful. So across the board, I think you've seen through this entire presentation um, and Dipanjan, thank you so much again for presenting. It's really awesome that Brands who really take these steps to be more human, to be more personalized, to even go a step further and analyze not only the actions they're taking and analyze when they're sending things to customers and what they're sending them, to, sending them, but how they're sending them, how they're positioning them, how they're communicating their customers in a human way. That's really the entirety of the package it takes to, to take that next step into this mobile generation and make sure that you're a trusted confidant rather than just another logo out there on someone's phone. Um, so, um, I really enjoyed this. I'd love to take some questions from the audience. We have uh, a couple of people coming in, uh, and uh, I wanted to take some questions. So, um, first question we have coming in um, is, is there a correlation between brand humanity index that uh, develop, foresters developed here, as well as MPS scores? Um, Dipanjan, do you have any comment on that? If not, I have some ideas. Um, I, I do. Uh, if you think about one of the early slides that I shared, one of the outcomes that we looked to driving with humanity is satisfaction and recommendation, right? Um, satisfaction is a very traditional customer experience metric, often used in a lot of companies in their dashboards. And the other one, as you referred to, of course, is the NPS score. And, and an NPS score essentially is an advocacy metric, right? Would I recommend this to someone else? So if you think back to that chart with four or five bars, you would remember that brands that demonstrate humanity also induce greater advocacy 
and influence people or encourage people to go out and say, hey, I would really recommend this brand. So in the data, we've clearly, clearly um, seen a positive correlation between NPS slash advocacy slash satisfaction with the humanity content of the brand. Yeah, I would completely agree. It's something that I think actually even here at Braze, as we measure our own NPS, getting more personal with our customers and making sure we're parceling out the right kinds of information that are going to help them take the next step for every single one of them, every single customer we work with, whether it be the next right enablement to, to unlock a new use case and a new way that they can be more human with their customers, that kind of personalization and targeting uh, is is core to what we think is going to drive increases in our own NPS scores as well. So next up, uh, we have a question here from Kelly Hall, uh, talking a little bit more about asking us to talk a little bit more about how Braze helps with the emotional connection. Um, I'll jump in on this one. I think that this is a fantastic question. So first of all, things some things I didn't talk about during the webinar specifically, but I think are crucial to this kind of emotional connection are really testing and auditing and thinking about the tone you're using with your customers. And this is something where a lot of our customers will start to think about the skeleton of the programs they want to send out. But then at every step of the way, they're using our multivariate testing to really make sure that they're developing the right tone and developing the right brand voice that's going to speak to each individual segment of their customer. Sometimes it's difficult to know the right thing off off the bat just because I think every single consumer base out there is different. If you even think about like at, at you know, similar uh, products like a Spotify and a SoundCloud, which I mentioned earlier, the kind of demographics and people that use those applications are really different. So they require a different brand voice. Um, every single, you know, every single special way that in tone that you develop is going to be individualized. So I think A-B testing is a really big part of that. And also, I think using things like liquid personalization to vary that tone based upon attributes about the users is a second piece, which can help you drive even a step deeper. And using, you know, using data that you have from the profile to inform content and using things like connected content to inform content, but then bringing that special sauce on top of it to give them the right message at the right time in the right way based upon what you know about that user. Well, I'll, I'll just add that uh, the expectation of brand personalization is very high. Um, from a, a related sphere, I've done a fair bit of research into smart speakers and voice technology. And what consumers tell you, and I think a full 74% of consumers believe that when brands represent themselves in things like Echo and Google Home, they should have their own personality and not use Alexa's or Siri's or Google's. So um, there is a tremendous need for brands to interface with consumers in their own unique way. And to the extent that every single channel of communication uh, can consistently deliver on that, that really enriches the brand experience. Completely agreed. So another question we have coming in uh, is asking, uh, based on the results you saw in our research here at Braze, do we think brands should always use be using action-based uh, and API-triggered sentence? And I would say uh, that every brand should be working that into their into their their repertoire consistently. It does have a little bit of activation cost in getting up and running with those things, but the results speak for themselves, and it's never actually as much as anyone thinks this is going to be going in. Uh, Every, every time you, for example, that you're pushing out new content, there's you know, an option to be developing a system where you're having an individual human schedule a send in the advance to send out some content about that information, or be developing a system which can deliver the content, but let the, on an automated basis, but let the humans be tweaking the tone, the, the methodology by which you deliver that content in the background through a tool like Braze, and letting them sort of tweak the system rather than tweak the actual individual content at a message by message level is often much more scalable, much more powerful. So um, another question here, I think it'd be great to get your thoughts on this from your background to punch and uh, from Charles here is what role do we feel that artificial intelligence will be playing with regard to bringing, 
uh, a human brand or improving your brand humanity? So I will go back to my comment on really the combination of human and machine being a potent force for delivering on emotions. Um, Again, in a, imagine a scenario where a consumer interacts with a human representative of the brand, right? This could be the store, it could be customer service. Um, you know, despite our best intentions, we are fallible, right? Uh, with artificial intelligence as a brand, um, you can develop a much better sense of what the right offering is, um, when to offer it, um, how to offer it. So really kind of the the brains, the gray cells hard at work, work much harder for artificial intelligence than for humans. Oftentimes, humans are an excellent conduit for this. I mean, if you speak with most consumers and if you look at most surveys out there, um, people still uh, profess an interest in interacting with human beings. If you ask people, hey, do you want to interact with robots at the store? I think 60 to 70% say, no, I want to interact with a human. However, that doesn't mean that they do not want their experience to be enriched by the power of artificial intelligence that the brand has harnessed. So I want better recommendations. Um, I want better intelligence from you as a brand to improve my life as a consumer. That's how you add value. Now, um, it, it's fascinating how these things are evolving. Again, I'll go back to this whole idea of voice technology and smart speakers. Um, someone that I've done some work with, he's filed a patent for artificial intelligence algorithms that can monitor your tone of voice, that can assess your distress level, and the machine, so be it Echo or Google Home, the voice can then interact with you in response to how you are feeling, right? So matching their emotional response to your emotional mindset. Now, we're not quite there yet. Um, I think we're a few years from that, but you've given machines that already had tremendous processing power and tremendous capacity, a veneer of the ability to interact emotionally. I don't think we are saying that machines and artificial intelligence in and of itself is the only solution. I think there's a, a great degree of complementarity between the emotions that stem from humanity and the emotional intelligence that stems from AI. But again, if you put them together, it can be really a tremendous force. Yeah, I completely agree that's the direction it's going. I mean, the, the sky is the limit for how things like real-time data consumption from smart speakers are enable us to further personalize in the future. I mean, I think a great example, though, taking a step back to something that a brand is doing now is uh, if I go back to that that push notification we had earlier in the presentation for Mamondo saying Shh, there's a you know $544 deal to New York available right now you know the the part of that that was artificially driven and driven by the system was there's a $544 plane ticket to New York that is very mechanical and robotic the part that was human about that was the tone and the messaging for someone to say, for this group of users, they're gonna to respond to something like, shh, I got a special deal for you. That's the human element that's always, I think for now, gonna be irreplaceable in the world of computers because we're just, we're not good at making those kind of uh, snap decisions on tone and things like that yet. But the actual content, that's that can really, I think, be driven by AI. And I think that really makes us seem even more human and more scalably human to all of those customers. And I think, Will, the, the other perhaps counterintuitive finding is that if AI could indeed shoulder some of the more mundane, mechanical, humdrum work that a brand does that really frees people up to do more value-added thing, right? I mean, if you walk into a store, for example, uh, oftentimes you're either seeking information or you're seeking advice. If you let the mechanical intelligence take care of information, which they are better at processing, then perhaps the human element can step in and advise you in a manner that is much more understanding of context and much more empathetic. 
week. So the ability of machines and artificial intelligence to do their work well empowers humans to do their work better. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Um, with that, I guess we'll take one final question. Um, and the last one was just uh, that, and I think this is a, a great one, uh, it's from Kelly asking, are there emotional areas of category that you feel is most important to focus on? If we distilled those ones that we had earlier to a couple of top ones, what would you say they are? So for me, Will, um, it is most important for a brand to demonstrate to a consumer that the brand is on the consumer's side, that the brand is an ally, that the brand works in the interest of the consumer. Um, this above all, uh, is what makes the difference. I think there are other things that the brand does that are powerful. Differentiation is powerful. The ability to service your consumer, your customer um, with warmth, with friendliness, with openness is also very important. But I think they all roll up into this idea that at the end of the day, as a brand, I am your partner. I will look out for you. Uh, and I will keep your interests in mind as we go about interacting in our daily business. Completely agree. I mean, I, th I, th I think that's absolutely critical. Anyways, uh, this has been a fantastic and informative. I've learned a lot. Uh, Dipanjan, thank you so much for joining us as our guest. Really enjoyed it. Um, if anybody would like to learn more about uh, Braze and our humanity, humanity and how we're helping brands approach that, that concept of humanity and, and, and measure that and act on it. Um, please go to raise.com slash humanity. Um, if you're a customer, please reach out to us as well. Uh, I would love to talk more. Uh, and uh, it's exciting to be here. Thank you everyone so much. Thank you.